keep to the subject matter. Um, welcome, and you've got the floor, Abel. Thank you very much. It's so lovely to be with you. And yes, memories of the past do come flooding in, and uh, we go back uh, a few moons, and it's so nice to be with your community again. I recognize some of the people there, uh, obviously your wife, I, I, I recognize the name, and Ella I recognize, and others. So it'll be a lovely time together. I'm going to uh, divide the session into a number of uh, uh, parts. What I want to do first is look at the nature of human personality so we can identify what is the nature of fear, um, what promotes anxiety, what are stressors. Um, then I want to look at coping mechanisms and transformation mechanisms. And I'm going to use meditation, which I've used in the past as the tool, but I'll introduce that and uh, explain it. And then what I'd like to do is to uh, my favorite part, which is to learn from you. And I can only learn from you if you speak to me. So I look forward to having a section where we actually discuss and converse and I can gain the information from your wisdoms. It's interesting, is it not, that five minutes, say even five seconds, before a person dies, their hearing is perfect. We should all live and uh, wait for Mashiach tomorrow coming. We should even have Yom Kippur and Eretz Yisrael, and it'll be a very different Yom Kippur. But five seconds before we die, if our physiology of the ears operate, we're hearing. Five seconds after we die, we can't hear. And I would ask you why, and you'll answer the obvious, because you're dead. But that explains nothing. What does it mean to be dead? It's just a, a, a phrase that explains a phenomenon without really going into it whatsoever. Now, what about eyes? Five seconds before you die, your eyes see, and five seconds after you die, your eyes don't see. What's happened? There's been no decomposition. The physiology of the ear and the eyes intact. It means there's some missing element. And that missing element is the energy that animates us, the energy which we call neshama as a generic term, some translated as soul. But we know there's some energy coursing through the body that utilizes the machinery of the body in order for us to have the experiences, the experience of hearing, the experience of seeing. And when that energy courses through the physiology of brain, and brain is not magic, Brain is not mysterious. Brain is a very complex biological machinery. The result is a human experience called mind, seichel, intellect, intelligence, cogitation, thinking. We know therefore we are a duality in that respect, that we're made up of our machinery of body and an energy that flows through it. Death means that the energy stops flowing through it. In other words, there's a dislocation within that duality. So we are two component parts and our personality, our response mechanisms, the way we respond to the exigencies of the moment, the way we're responding to COVID, the way we're responding to political fears or international fears is all a matter of how we navigate direct the flow of consciousness. And therefore I've introduced another word, consciousness. And consciousness is the sum total of the neshama flowing through the guf, the soul flowing through the body in all of our capacities, the five senses, intelligence, emotion, etc. There is, however, the navigator. I've said there's two parts to us soul and body, neshama and guf. And yet you and I know that we can direct the flow of consciousness, which means that within our true self, our inner personality, which is the soul, because the body is just machinery, there are levels. I'm not going to go into the complexity of the levels of nefesh, ruach, neshama, chai, and But all I'm going to say is, the higher level of the soul 
is able to direct itself through the body. It's as if there is a driver in the car and the driver of the vehicle is the highest level of the soul. Therefore, we can control and direct our responses. Let me now turn to a phraseology seemingly quite separate from what I've said, but relating to it. Victim. What does it mean to have a victim mentality? I divide into two parts. There are, there is the state of victimization, and then there's a state of victimhood. What's the difference? Victimization is what others try to do to me. Victimhood is if I choose to be a victim. Now I'm using the word choose advisedly, choose to be a victim. In previous lectures, we've discussed some of the uh, insights of Viktor Frankl. And many of you have read his book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he was the one who posited very dramatically that the Nazis could take away the freedom of his body. However, they could not take away the freedom of his mind. He could choose, I'm using the word choose again, how to respond to the circumstances of the victimizer's attempt to victimize him. They could imprison his body, but he chose not to be a victim. Another writer and Holocaust survivor, uh, some of you may have read her book, Edith Eger. The book is called The Choice, a very worthwhile book. She went on to become a very well-known psychoanalyst in the United States and helped a lot of people as a consequence of her experiences in the camps. Recalls in her book how her mother says to her, as she's a teenager, rounded up by the Nazis, Remember, they cannot take your mind. These are very, very important factors. People try to victimize others, which means to assault us mentally, emotionally. And a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking that thereby you must be a victim. And the answer is not. You choose to be a victim or not or you simply cave in automatically and become a victim. So I often tell people who feel that they are victimized, you can choose not to be a victim. How to do that will come to. But the point being is there is a choice and you don't automatically have to become a victim of the other person's victimization processes. Having said that, what happens between victimization and the choice of being a victim is often states of fear. So the climate of COVID makes us feel afraid. The climate of COVID attempts to victimize us. Not only that, I find, for example, in your country, there's a whole climate of political fear. And not only a fear, but a fear that results in the degree of antipathy and splitting of society as hasn't been had for perhaps some centuries. The result is you live in an atmosphere where fear breeds such degree of partisanship that the result is we begin to fear each other's words and we become victimized by other people's words instead of choosing not to be a victim and being able to have a set of personal strengths that respond to the victimization and the resultant fear. Having moved through these two stages of discussion so far, that our personality is ultimately residing in our neshama, in our soul, not our body. Having said, that we have the capacity to navigate the soul through the body or to navigate consciousness. And now having noted that you and I have the capacity to withstand other people's imposition of fear or victimization through an act of free choice, 
I've begun to discuss the status quo, but what about the mechanics, how to be able to obviate the situation? So let's look at some of these words that we use today. Anxiousness, anxiety, stress. These are subtleties of emotion. However, emotion, midos, emotion doesn't arise out of nowhere. Yes, emotions are the products of the soul, but they are also the result of the way the soul operates through the brain creating mind. I'm going to make a big statement now. All emotions are the product of mind. Repeat, all emotions are the product of mind, meaning to have a feeling, a feeling of response, you must have an interpretation first. If your mind doesn't interpret, the emotions won't flow. Even those people who claim, oh, I'm just totally emotional, or that person's just emotional. Yes, that means there's a huge quantum of emotion flow with very little consciousness or time input into formulation of a mind position, an attitude. And therefore, they don't even recognize it's a microsecond and it's gone, and therefore, they're just emotional. The Alter Rebbe, as we've said previously, in a previous set of lectures, noted the mastery teaching, Moyach Shalit Al Halev, in his famous Sefer Tanya, which says, the mind determines the outcomes of the emotions. Jewish self mastery is the capacity to be able to allow the mind to shape the emotions wisely. And now, when I say the word wise, I'm introducing yet a whole other discussion, which I don't have time to discuss at the moment. What is wisdom? In fact, what is criteria? What are the criteria of good and bad? What are the criteria of wise and unwise? Where do values arise? Are they the random democratic majority process of the culture in which we happen to live in, which will always change? And therefore, one set of cultural values says this is good, and another set of cultural values in the same society, maybe a generation later, says, no, that was bad. In other words, where values are relativistic, that's not Judaism. Judaism says there is an ultimate set of good and there's an ultimate set of bad. There's an ultimate set of right. There's an ultimate set of wrong. And wisdom is to be able to train oneself to ride the wave of absolute goodness. That's why Jewish people for thousands of years have been able to maintain our own identity our own cultural milieu, our own individual positions in context of the majority of society. We may be living, you may be living in the United States, a polarization between Trump and Biden, and you may be using the uh, media pundits to determine for you which way you should be thinking. Not us, not Jewish people. We're above it all. We have criteria that decides for us what is wise and not is not wise. Now, I'm not going to put my uh, head out and tell you what's the wise choice you have to make. That you'll have to determine yourself, or at least ask your rabbi, I'll pass the buck. However, the point I'm making here is that mind determines our emotions. And that's why people get so emotional about politics, because their minds have been so made up. Okay, having said that, Fear is an emotion. If I can change my interpretation of the moment, if I can change my attitudinal response, my emotion will change as well. Therefore, how do you transform fear? Which uh, uh, um, Rabbi said at the introduction. That means to be able to reinterpret. So you look again at the situation, stepping back from it. Let's use COVID as an example. COVID is 
a pandemic. That's already a frightening word, which immediately makes us feel that we're helpless and things are hopeless. That's how the word has been brought out through the media projection for us to interpret. And media, as you've heard me say before, is not a beneficent educational institution. The media is a commercially exploitative mechanism with one goal in mind, profit. And the way it makes profits is by ratings. Ratings invite advertisers. And they know full well psychologically that the way that they will get their ratings up is if they glue you to the screen. And they know full well that the best way to glue you to the screen is by making you afraid, fear. Because when you're afraid, you continue watching and listening. So the media propagates fear. And as a consequence, you are programmed to be afraid. COVID has done that. That's not to deny the morbidity of COVID. It is a very deadly illness and we have to take all precautions. I'm a big, very big proponent of lockdown. I'm a very big proponent in terms of curfew. I'm a very big proponent of taking of the government legislating compulsorily that we take health measures, whether they be masks or social distancing, etc. But I know that more people die from car accidents than from COVID. I know that the flu has taken many more lives in 2018 and 19 than COVID did. Therefore, I put it into perspective. It is an occurrence of an illness that we have to defend ourselves. But I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm going to recognize that I have to take measures and I'm going to be confident that I can overcome it. I won't be stupid and consequently invite the illness into my body. But at the same time, I'm not going to be paralyzed by it. Here I am in my home and here in Melbourne, we have a much greater degree of governmental intervention. We are locked up in our homes. We're not allowed to leave our homes except for one hour for exercise. We can go shopping only once a day. Um, there are other very major restrictions. After um, eight o'clock at night, we can't go out of our homes. And you know what? We have running water. We have food. We have a communication system that keeps us in touch with all members of the family, whether they be here or overseas. Are we suffering? Compared to Viktor Frankl, compared to uh, uh, Edith Eger, compared to my grandparents who were murdered in the Holocaust, my, my wife's uh, uh, grandparents who were murdered in the Holocaust. I mean, in comparison to that, I'm living a life of luxury. You see how my attitudinal response has created a different emotional polarity within me? And we can do that with everything. But we also have to have a recognition that our capacity to be able to do that exists. What do I mean by that? It's another very important notion. I'm going to seemingly segue, but I'll relate it again. When science laboratories around the world make breakthroughs, and this has been noted now for at least 100 years, when they make breakthroughs on some area of research which has been baffling, immediately after that lab has made the breakthrough, Almost instantly, another lab in another part of the world that has been totally oblivious of the first lab's efforts also makes a breakthrough and it becomes then a multiplier effect. It's as if when the solution is found, that enters into the ether of space, if I can use a metaphor, which is picked up from space by someone else, by others. I'll use another example to uh, indicate this, although slight variation. 
Do you remember who broke the first, who's the first person to break the four minute mile? To run faster than four minutes for the mile. It was Roger Bannister in England. I think it was early fifties. It was considered by science, health sciences, impossible to break the four minute barrier until Roger Bannister did. As soon as he did, John Landy did it, Herb Elliott did it, they happened to be Australians. But in other words, soon after, people were breaking miles, mile barriers. For centuries, no one could, and now they could. It's as if two factors are in play. One, that information is somehow seminally put out there, number one. Number two, and this is the part that I want to focus on, when we know we can do it, that it can be done, then we do it. When we know that we can withstand the scourge of COVID and that we can live a life under different circumstances temporarily in order to protect ourselves, we build confidence. We turn off the media. We listen to the news once a day for five minutes instead of constantly being glued to it. And then we put it to sleep and we use our own resources. Fear. The Hebrew word for fear is pachad, but there's another word for fear, and that's yira. Pachad, uh, for, uh, for our purpose of discussion, is the common fear of being afraid of fire, for example. You don't want to come close to fire, it can burn you. Yira, for our purposes, because there are deeper meanings of both words, yira means something more than simple fear of common hurt and pain. Yura actually can possibly mean a state of awe, A-W-E. The word awe means being impressed by the greatness of something and feeling that humble sense of smallness in its presence. I'm saying transform the common fear into a state of awe, but awe of what? We know that everything is purposeful. Nothing happens in the world without it having specific redeeming virtues and specific goals. That's what God is. There is a God, the divine accountant, the master uh, um, software programmer of life, and everything has its place. Kabbalah teaches us that a blade of grass doesn't grow unless there is a flow of energy called the muzzle, its muzzle, which is able to cause it to grow. By the way, that's what the word muzzle means. I know most people think muzzle means luck. That's a wrong translation. The word mazal comes from the verb nozel in the Tanakh, you have nozel milvanon, flow. Mazal means flow. When we, sh when we wish someone mazal tov, we're actually enunciating a very profound blessing. We're saying to the person, may the spiritual energy that animates you flow much more profoundly and strongly in you. That's what we say when we say mazal tov. Doesn't mean good luck. Absolutely not. Okay, coming back to our point. So, what is the mechanism that we can use to change our attitudinal response? Because we're creatures of habit. We've been made to be afraid so many times in our lifetime, specifically by media, and our quotient of resistance is rising greater and greater, and therefore the cinema industry has to shock us more and more in order to implant that fear. And there it goes on and on. So the, uh, 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 the, the, the film industry becomes much more daring constantly from year to year so that our shock effect can be greater. We have a resistance to it. So what we need to do is to undo the habit of fear. How do you undo the habit of fear? Why do I say habit? with some of us have discussed this previously when we talked about the way that the brain is actually plastic 
neuroplasticity, plastic in the sense that it's changeable and stretchable and moldable. When you think a thought over and over again, when you have an attitude over and over again, it means that there is a certain pathway between two nerve end fibers of the cells of the brain, which are connected at that moment by neurotransmitters. Now, when you make these neurotransmitters run that course, the same one over and over again, it's very likely they'll be able to do it much more easily next time. Therefore, if you continue repeating a negative thought over and over again, which we habitually do, you'll be able to do it more and more easily and you'll be more and more in fear. The same holds with anger, by the way. For three generations, psychologists have been telling us that the most important aspect of anger is to get to let it out. Get rid of it. Let it flow. Say it as it is. Get it off your chest. And now we've discovered, discovered through neuroplasticity that it's been totally wrong. All you do by venting anger is rehearsing it. All you're doing by venting anger is allowing that pathway of the mind to be practiced more and more. You become better at anger. You don't get rid of anything. Another discussion for another time. However, the point is, same with fear. And if we have to undo the fear pathways, and they're well embedded, because that's been probably our circumstance for most of our contemporary life. To undo a pathway, you have to set a new pathway and make the old pathway become disused. Let grass grow over it. No longer is it gonna be traversed. How do you set down a new pathway of the mind? Remember, mind shapes emotions. If you can change your mind, you can change your emotions. So I have to set down a new pathway. To do that, I have to practice like practicing piano for the first time. How do you practice piano? Scales, repeated over and over again until the fingers are able to respond the way that the mind wants the fingers to respond. But you can only do that by repeating over and over again. When you first sat down at the piano, the fingers didn't respond. They had another habitual uh, mechanism and it wasn't directed to playing the notes on the keyboard. But once you practice, 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 you set down new pathways that the fingers were related to that direction of the mind. Same with fear. We have to be able to learn different scales, new music, and as a consequence of the new interpretation of circumstances and how to be positive rather than negative, we're able to change our emotions. How do you become more positive rather than negative? And the two words which I have said to audiences all over the world over and over again, were the words emuna and bitachon, faith and security. But they're mere translations, emuna and bitachon. What do they really mean? And I've said emuna means, as the Rebbe's explained, emuna means to adopt a belief that everything that has ever happened to you is for your current good, no matter what. It may have been painful in the past, but somehow or other, it is for our current good. That's emunna. Bitachon, bitachon, which usually translates as trust and security, but the Rebbe explained it pragmatically in the following way, is the belief that the challenge you face now, COVID, will have a positive outcome. What's the difference between the two? Emunna deals from the past to the present. Whatever is, has ever happened to us is for our current good. No matter what it was, it's purposeful. Bitochen deals from the present to the future. The challenge I face now will have a positive outcome. Now, if you adopt a pathway in your brain that will allow you to begin there, they become the baseline beliefs. Everyone has beliefs. Don't tell me there are people who don't have beliefs. Everyone has beliefs. Everyone. 
I don't mean necessarily even theological beliefs. You know, when you get into the car, it's because you think you're going to get to point B from point A, notwithstanding all the accidents on the road, God forbid, notwithstanding that something could go quite wrong with a car and even blow up, slight chance that it might be. But modern person with perfect equanimity steps into the car. Why? Because they believe they'll get to point B. You don't know that. You're not a prophet. You don't know the future. So I'm asking you to adopt beliefs. And the belief I want you to adopt is that whatever challenge we're facing now will have a positive outcome. I want you to adopt the belief that the cup is half full, not half empty. There's a 50-50 statistical probability either way, so that I'm on equal ground thinking positively is negatively. How many of you can honestly say, I'm a positive thinker? When circumstances arise, I don't automatically go to a fear quotient, that I allow my mind to dissect it and adopt belief of positive outcome, because I'm not a prophet, so I'll choose to believe positively. This is the transformation of fear. And it comes from the mind. And the way that's one of the mechanisms that's best used in order to train it is meditation. Now, if you consult Professor Google as to what is meditation, you're going to find hundreds of different definitions, different modalities and the like. But what I'm saying to you, excuse me a moment. <coughs> But what I'm saying to you is that um, you can deliberately utilize meditative practice in such a way that you can adopt a belief system of positivity. And it'll make you much more fulfilled. I'm going to give you two rationales why you should adopt belief in positivity rather than negativity. Undoing fear. And the two are as follows. We know full well with the mind-body medicine model that the way we think translates down to the cellular level of the body, creating health or illness. We know full well that people who are habitually negative thinkers create a greater incidence of illness in their life, shorter lifespans than positive thinkers. So that's one good rationale to be a positive induced individual. Health and wellness, that's a mitzvah because health and wellness is an absolute mitzvah. And the second rationale why you should choose to believe in positive outcome is the result of Harvard University producing research results last year of a multi-generational study that says the singular factor that contributes to happiness in life is quality of relationships. Relationships, their quality, determine your happiness and fulfillment quotient. Well, you know full well that people who are negative tend to repel relationships. People don't like to be around negative people. People don't like to be around pessimists. People like to be around optimists. People like to be around people who are able to provide hope and aspiration. And therefore, if you choose positivity, the antithesis of fear, your relationships will prosper and your happiness quotient will ar arise. Therefore, I've given you two rationales why you should blindly adopt belief in positivity. And since you're not a prophet, that's as good as being negative, statistically. So I'm going to take you through a couple of meditative, meditative exercises now to be able to show you how you can begin the process of personal transformation. I'm going to divide the exercise into two parts. First, you have to move away from a posture of negativity, from a posture of fear. To do that, you have to provide neutral ground first, a level playing field. You can't just jump from one to the other. Level playing, playing field. And I'm going to do that with the breath exercise, which some of us have done previously. 
and exists in many uh, 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 approaches of many systems. But in Judaism, breath is particularly significant because the word for breath is neshima, and the Hebrew word for soul is neshama, obviously the same term, which means that breath is the first level of expression of the soul. And through a biofeedback loop effect, by changing the way you breathe, you alter the way that the neshama flows through the guf, that the soul flows through the body into a relaxed state rather than an anxious state. So that's what we'll do first up. And then I'm going to take you through a visualization exercise, which will help you to feel a sense of personal strength in the face of all the effects of the world that try to victimize us. And we can therefore resist and not choose victimhood. Okay, adopt the following posture, just uh, sitting where you are, feet on the ground symmetrically, um, hands resting on knees and thighs, back fairly straight, head well balanced on the shoulders, shoulders just a little bit slumped, and gently close your eyes. And just focus on your breath, gently breathing in and breathing out quite normally, quite naturally. But just being aware of the flow of breath. And if you can, prefer to breathe in and out through your nose. <coughs> Breathing slower now and deeper through your nose. And as you do, become aware of the difference in temperature of the air entering the nasal passages compared to the air exiting from the nose. You will find slightly cooler air entering and slightly warmer air exiting. Breathe deeply and be aware of that temperature difference in your nose. Cool, warm. Slow down and deepen your breathing even more and with your next breaths Direct the breath down to your abdomen, collecting the air there. And the best way to achieve that is, as you breathe in, expand your abdomen at the same time, collecting the air. And then pull your tummy in to expel the air. So take a slow, deep breath in, expanding your abdomen, collecting the air there and then pulling your abdomen in, expelling the air. This is a little counterintuitive, so practice it. Slow and deep makes it easier. Expanding your abdomen as you breathe in, drawing the air down. And now let's lend some rhythm to the breathing. We'll breathe in for a count of three, hold for a count of three, and then expel the air for a count of four, abdominally. Take a slow, deep breath in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. In, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. You just continue breathing deeply, rhythmically, abdominally, 
gracefully, smoothly, perfect circle. And just be aware at the back of your mind how relaxed you have become in the space of a few short minutes, totally removed from life's pressures, removed from victimization, just neutral territory. God breathes life into the universe. Everything breathes. In and out. The sun rises. The sun sets. The tide comes in. The tide goes out. The petals open. The petals close. God breathes life into the universe. Now gently segue to the next exercise. Picture in your mind a point source of light. Just a light that provides gentle warmth and brightness in your head, in the middle of your head. Allow that light source to glow a little more so that your face and head and neck enjoy the glow and the warmth generated by that source of light in your head. Intensify the glow so it begins to glow lower down through your chest and back your upper torso. Feel that glow generated from the center of your head, flowing down through your neck, providing a glow and warmth in your upper body. Now extending to your arms, wrists, hands, fingers, feeling that glow and warmth. Intensify the source of light further so that now it will flow down to the lower body, through your thighs, legs, feet, toes, your whole body feels a glow, a glow with your neshama, your soul, which enters your being from the top of your head. Intensify the glow even further in the center of the head so it begins to radiate through the skin of your whole body, creating a glow around you, an aura all around you. We call this aura Magen Abraham, Abraham's shield protecting you, providing a barrier to anything and anyone who seeks to harm you.
be very aware of the aura around your skin, the Mogen Avram, and feel safe in this cocoon. Because this shield, this aura, protects you. It is godliness flowing through you, creating a shield around you. Feel safe, feel secure. You activate this shield through awareness, consciousness, being aware of the flow through your body, extending through your skin. When you are aware of that shield, you activate it. Spend a few more moments committing yourself to activating your shields as needed and feeling safety. Return to your focus on your breath, gently breathing in through the nose and out through the nose, becoming aware again of the difference in temperature, cooler air entering, warmer air exiting. Gently begin moving your fingers and your toes. Move your fingers and toes wherever you are now. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes, coming all the way back to our session. Well, we've covered a lot in a short space of time, and I don't pretend for one moment that we've explored it sufficiently. But I did want to provide you with headlines as to the mechanics of who we are and the powers that we possess and our capacities, which arise so much from consciousness and awareness and our mental attitudes and the resulting emotional expressions and how you and I can have control of these things. And then I've provided you with an exercise to be able to move away from states of fear and create a level playing field, and even then induce states of confidence, positivity, belief in the future. And I'm hoping that the time together is very appropriate before Yom Kippur, because before Yom Kippur, we really do introspect and ask ourselves, who am I? And I am not what the world wants me to be. I am I. And to be able to make that I the best I possible. Yes, to regret uh, some of the things that we've done, to have remorse over them, even have some sense of guilt. But at the same time, to recognize we can change. And that's the element of teshuva, which is the basis here of Yom Kippur. Teshuva means that you can return to normalcy, the word lashuv, to return, to shuva, the process of returning to be a normal person. What's normal? Well, if you measure it by uh, social standards, psychological standards, it'll vary constantly, as I said earlier. The Torah tells us what's normal for a Jewish soul. Be normal, practice to shuva, return to that state of Jewish normalcy that has allowed us to exist longer than any society, any culture in the history of the world, three and a half thousand years. Okay, I'm going to pause at this moment and uh, perhaps we have an opportunity to speak to each other. So I hand it back to you, Rabbi, all yours.
Thank you so much, Rabbi Wolf. That was great. Um, I have allowed everyone to unmute themselves. So whoever wants to, uh, anyone that has any questions or comments, please uh, unmute yourself and speak to everyone. Uh, Rabbi, thank you for that. Uh, I've, I've been able to have the privilege of tuning into your uh, sessions many times, and I'm, I'm always just amazed about how, how much knowledge you give pre before going in and the level of depth that you take everybody to. Um, and I think this was just really pointed for the time that we're in. And uh, I, I have never heard about the shields of Abraham and that uh, protection. So um, I'm going to definitely keep that one and continue to practice it. So thank you so much. And then also taking this into Yom Kippur, I think it is uh, definitely a strong tool. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alexa. Yes, uh, um, life has armed us with tools, but we also have tools that have been uh, provided for us. And we often don't make enough use of our inner strengths. Uh, we succumb to the more superficial impressions of people around us and the media around us. So know that you and I have very, very able tools which Hashem has armed us with to be able to withstand all elements in all centuries, all sicknesses and all threats. We have ways of overcoming at all times. Thank you. By the way, I did put down on my uh, on the chat my email address. Um, I provide daily meditations, three minutes, four minutes, um, for anyone who wants to uh, receive them. They come on WhatsApp. So if you were to email me and give me your cell number, I'll put you on a WhatsApp list, and you'll have every day a meditation to be able to make the day work much better. So feel free. And I also um, have placed uh, the name of my one of my books, which is uh, uh, doing very well. And that explains the nature of personality, explains more about what is fear and the counter to fear in that text. So you might want to be able to get hold of that. Rab, I've got a quick question. Yes. Thank you, Rabbi. I'm curious if you have any thoughts as it relates to populations that are not typically developing, that since this is an active pursuit of mindful self-awareness, self-regulation, for those who are facing mental illness or have chronic illnesses that yes. inhibit yes. some of the practices that we're talking about that are more mindful, yes at a higher yes. level of function. Any, sure. any thoughts on how to engage those of, of yes. lesser capability, objective capability? Yeah, so David, the body that we receive has got its limitations directly designed to meet the reincarnative agenda of this particular life of the soul. So our soul never changes. The soul that you have has always been. From the time of creation, a fixed number of souls were created and they reincarnate. However, the body changes. We're given different bodies in different lifetimes because there are different agendas for the soul's continuous journey. That's as a general rule why sometimes someone is given a particular body which provides a more difficult obstacle course for the soul's expression well that's up to the divine accountant and there's purpose in that but the pass or fail so to speak of any lifetime is not measured against each other Pass and fail is independently measured by that soul navigating that body. So if God forbid 
someone loses an arm. And say, for the sake of argument, it's a, a, a tefillin arm that you usually put on. Um, you can't put tefillin on that arm. Okay, so you put it on the other arm. But what I'm saying is that there are purpose in limitations which you and I can't understand. Sometimes people, God forbid, are born with a brain that doesn't function optimally. It's deliberately so. But their individual challenge has got its own measuring stick and their degree of personal fulfillment and personal happiness is individualized. We sometimes looking on someone who might be deficient from our vantage point have a sense of uh, uh, compassion that somehow or other they suffer. But the truth is many of us realize as you are together with people who are in some ways say deficient in terms of the mind that they have their own level of optim optimization of their life. Now, let's go one step further. That's the more absolute cases. We alter also our body by the way we think. Let's take depression. I'm not using the word depression in its common sense. I'm talking say clinical depression. What's clinical depression? Clinical depression means that we have worked ourselves to such a state, to coin a phrase, that we've changed the chemistry of the body. That the body itself has chemically changed and therefore I'm no longer capable of interpreting life in a manner which I could previously. Sometimes with the wonders of modern medicine and medicine throughout history, we're able to reverse body processes, body illnesses, so that through the imposition of chemical means of changing the body back or neutralizing the negativity, and that is anti-depression medication, we're able to allow that person to reach another level playing field where they can function again and exercise free choice again. Because when they're clinically depressed, they can't exercise free choice in the truest sense of the word. Sometimes we hurt ourselves and that can never be changed back. But in most circumstances, most, we're able through an activity of mind, medicine, and body function to restore our bodies. So in answer to your question, you know, we can't judge why it is that some people are born in a manner which has their hands figuratively tied behind their back, but that becomes an individual test on their part, which we can't measure by our lives. Thank you. Question. Certainly. This is uh, my name is Annie Zeruya. Yes. And I, um, I wanted to ask you if you know, know when does a soul come into a body? Is it at conception, at birth, at what time does the soul decide to come down into a certain body? Okay, fine. So a soul doesn't decide. Um, the divine accountant decides when and how and who and which set of parents and uh, 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 which culture and uh, um, what will be the uh, nature of the body, etc. But your point is still a, a valid question. Um, when does this actually happen? When does insolment happen? So the answer is, as you said first up, at conception. Till conception, the neshama, the soul, is a free agent, so to speak, enjoying its uh, uh, presence uh, in the divine palace, if I can use an old uh, metaphor. And then God says, you, time for you to pop down. And the soul comes down and the human beings become the receptacle through conception of that soul. Now, at the moment when the soul is um, within the mother's womb, from the moment that it's a, 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 a single cell, 
because don't forget souls don't occupy too much space they can exist uh, even in smaller spaces than single cells and the like um uh, it, it becomes not fully implanted in the body because the body has not yet evolved and developed and therefore it's as if it hovers around that future body but as the body evolves within the mother the soul becomes more filled into the body and then at birth it's fully so um, till birth there isn't a total ensoulment within the body but after birth, and then we wait 30 days for that complete process to take place, at that point, it's completely ensouled. Thank you. Someone asked a question on the chat about cognitive behavioral uh, therapy um, and behavioral uh, therapy generally. And yes, of course, uh, Judaism is, leans much more to the uh, uh, modern terminology of behavioral approaches. Um, behavioral approaches, I should say, fit much better into the Jewish model. And the reason is um, because we change ourselves from the outside in. Um, when we stood at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, and we said, Na'aseh we will do, and then we'll try to understand. It means by the doingness of life, we create more powerful ways of learning and changing than trying to do the opposite. So let me say a very a flippant comparison of behavioral and Freudian psychology. Freudian psychology tries to understand what are the elemental aspects within the mind that produce the effect. And you can spend many years spending time with a Freudian approach, and maybe at the end of 10 years, you might or might not have an answer or an accurate answer. The behavioral approach more or less says, if I can put it simplistically, forget why you, how you got to be the way you are, just change it now. And you change it now from the outside in. So for example, um, if I were to teach you to swim, and I took you through a, uh, uh, a three session, PowerPoint course in a classroom, and I made you do all the movements of the arms and the legs needed for swimming. And at the end of three sessions, I gave you a certificate. And then you jumped into the water and almost drowned. The answer is because you haven't had the doingness of it. By not learning too much about water and swimming, but first allowing yourself to be in there to feel the buoyancy and to recognize the change circumstances, that's when you can start a learning process to change the way that your body behaves in water as it does on earth, not in water. Likewise, in psychology, the approach we take is, if you want to change, do things differently. When you do things differently, you will think about them differently. And when you think about them 